Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Well, we're going to pray as we begin our worship here this morning. And Lord, we are here in your presence, grateful and thankful to you for the God that you are, and thank you that you're at work in our lives, and thank you that on this holiday weekend, Lord, you are with us, and we pray that your blessing would rest upon this time. Thank you, Lord, that this is holy ground. Your presence is in this place, and Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory this morning. We rise up, Lord, to proclaim your goodness and your majesty, Lord, and we thank you that the Holy Spirit is here. Thank you that you are in this place and you are working and moving. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring glory to Jesus in our lives and in this place today. Let your presence fall upon us, Lord, as a mighty rain as we give the Lord the glory in our lives here today. And Father, we just ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. It's a good day to praise the Lord. Good day to worship the Lord. Amen. It's good to give Him praise, to give Him honor, give Him glory, because He's worthy of our praises. We love you, Jesus. And I will rise up, and I will worship the Lord and exalt Him.
rise up. Wait, remember the song called Arise. Don Moen's song, I will rise up and worship you, Lord. It's good to worship the Lord in the morning, isn't it? It's good to worship. Can you give him praise this morning? Give him honor. Give him glory. Tell me, love him. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, Lord, as we worship you, make your presence known in this place, God, and in our lives.
sides of this place, God. Always your name, Lord. Can somebody say I'm a friend of God? Can you say that today? Are you a friend of God? It's good to know the Lord, isn't it? Good to know him. It's good that he knows us. And you know what? Um, we, a lot of times we say, I found the Lord. I think he's found us first. He knew about us before we were even born. We acknowledged who he was, accepted him as personal savior, but he's the one that found us and made a way for us. That's why it's so good to be a friend of God, to be a friend of the Lord. Help me out, Dennis. I'm a friend.
As we uh, come to God's Word today, we're going to continue in uh, the theme that we've been pursuing. And I'd like to go back and read from Psalm 105 and verse 17. Actually, verse, uh, yeah, verse 17. Been looking at the life of Joseph. And today we're going to be looking at the turnaround when things started to go the right way after a lot of years where they went the wrong way. Psalm 105, verse 17, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the peoples, and set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler over all his possessions to imprison his princes at will that he might teach his elders wisdom. So today we're going to be looking at the turnaround. So let's pray here. And Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We pray that as we continue in our study in the life of Joseph. We ask that you would speak to our hearts and lives. And Lord, uh, many of us have a word that is testing us. There's something that you have made real to us that it just seems like things have gone the wrong direction ever since we began to trust you for something. But Lord, thank you that even though your word tests us, thank you that you have a timing for a fulfillment. And we just pray that you'll strengthen all of our hands today, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So praise the Lord. We um, have been in this study for quite a while now, and we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 41 at this point, and going to be talking about uh, the fulfillment of the dreams, at least the beginning of the fulfillment, the beginning of the turnaround that would lead to the fulfillment of um, what Joseph had when he was 17 years of old. So by the time we get to Genesis chapter 41, we find that Joseph has gone through just terrible, terrible problems in his life, and things that he uh, never would have expected, never would have anticipated, and I, I think that we all can identify to that. I th I'm sure if we were to ask, is there anyone in this room who's never gone through a hard time that you never saw coming, I don't think any one of us would have our hands up because we can all identify that, uh, uh, you know, we've had to face some things that we never thought we would have to face and learn to trust the Lord through those things. So. At that point, here we are in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 1, and Pharaoh is beginning to have his dreams now. And if you have your Bible, you can open it to that passage with us. And the scripture says here in Genesis 41, you can read along with me. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he was standing by the Nile. Now, uh, if you're new to us today, this is not two years after Joseph's trouble started. This is two years after he was forgotten about in the prison by the man he spoke God's word into and he hoped would get him out of the prison. He stayed in the prison another two years. And uh, I'm sure that at this point in his life, he had very little expectation that things were going to get radically better for him. And you know, there's a lot of people who are in that very position. It seems like we've been beat up so long. We've faced adversity for so long. Sometimes we just settle into, I guess this is just the way it's going to be. And Joseph, I'm sure, was thinking that when he was in the prison, trying to come to terms and, and being resolved to, uh, it's, it's not going to change. It's not going to get any better. He's, this has been 17 years of his life at this point, or 13 years of his life at this point, I'm sorry. 
13 years of his life. And do you know what? These were the prime years of his life that were eaten up by unfairness, disaster, trouble, uh, negative circumstances, betrayal, uh, all these things being lied about. Some of the prime years of his life have been consumed through problems that he never would have foreseen coming upon him and actually problems that he never deserved. He, he never deserved uh, the things that happened to him. But there he was. He found himself being sold into, into slavery, human trafficking. He found himself uh, being bought by somebody, Potiphar. He found himself being lied about by Potiphar's light, wife and having to go into prison in the home that he had governed. And all these things are, have been gone against him. Now he finds himself forgotten about by someone whom he hopes can help him. And so there's all this backlog. But I want to tell you, when life seems to be going the wrong way, here's something you can count on. God's doing something that you can't see yet. And there's things that are taking place that you don't know about yet. But God knows about them, and God sees them. And it, it's, uh, Joseph was in that position. Two more years have gone. I'm about to turn 66. I can't even imagine how long it's going to take for me to turn 68. But that's how long Joseph stayed in the prison, another two years after he had this high hope that this thing was going to turn around for him. And it didn't for two more years. But at the end of these two years, Pharaoh had dreams. And so we read the first verse in that. That happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the wind, sprouted up after them. He had these dreams, and he knew that something significant was being conveyed to him, but he didn't know what it was. He knew that these dreams were not an accident. He knew that he was troubled. It says in verse 8, Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So he's, he, he's aware that that. Somehow God is trying to get his attention, and he can't figure out what it is that these dreams represent. The chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth was there with us, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. Joseph has no idea what is taking place in Pharaoh's palace. All he knows is he's been in a prison for a long time, and there's no escape in his mind in the natural. There's no way he's going to get out of that in the natural. And the things that God had promised him earlier in his life seemed impossible. In fact, they were forgotten. Later on, it says he remembered the dreams that he had. He he wasn't even thinking about these things anymore. He was just in the drudgery of 
of life as it was, unfair as it was. He doesn't know that over in this palace, this baker, this uh, cupbearer who has forgotten about him for the two years is now speaking to Pharaoh, saying, well, there was a Hebrew youth who was in that prison, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard. That was Potiphar. See, even in the prison, he was, Potiphar asked him to watch over these two men. And I think a lot of people would have known that uh, Potiphar's life was on the line in this matter. If, if this did not go well with these two prisoners, Potiphar was a dead man. And he had no vengeance in his heart. He could have tried to, you know, a lot of people could have seen this as an opportunity for revenge. But Joseph wasn't that kind of person. He saw it as an opportunity to serve. And he served Potiphar, who threw him in that prison by serving and taking care of the two men that Potiphar had specifically asked him to take care of the Pharaoh's prisoners in that jail, in the house that he had governed until he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of attempted rape and imprisoned there in that place. Uh, what, What kind of a spirit did this man have that he could rise to these occasions of unfairness in his life and be godly? You know, that's what God's looking for in this. I think people are looking for that. People are looking for God's people to demonstrate a godliness in the face of hardship and trial, in the face of uh, where we might want to strike back. We don't, and that's what meekness is. Jesus was meek. Didn't mean he didn't have strength. He could control his strength and use his strength in positive ways rather than in negative ways. So here's Joseph. Pharaoh, all this is going on, and he's not even aware of it. But Genesis 41, verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Boy, he must have been a sight, you know. They had to shower him. They, you know, they had to, I mean, he must have been a mess in that prison. I don't think they had laundry machines in that prison. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, you were in there. It was pretty rough stuff. It was pretty grim. And they, uh, they took care of him. They got him all dressed up so he'd look good when he came before Pharaoh. And in verse 15, I just want to try to catch up a little bit here. These are some of the things that we've talked about. 13 years have passed. He's lost what what many people would consider the best years of his life. And what we see is not all that is true. When you're going through a hard time, there's so much else that is true that you can't see it because God's doing things that you're not aware of. A lot is happening, but we have no idea about it until it is the time. And isn't that what faith really is all about? Trusting God when, you know, some people think they they have faith when everything is going well. And yeah, they do, they do. But you know what? When you have faith when things are not going well, that's a deeper marker of faith. Maybe that's the sincere faith that the Bible talks about that was in people. A faith that that can handle it when adversity comes and when trial comes and, and when hardship comes upon you. You you have a sincere faith that gets you through those types of things. You can handle adversity and hardship. And these are uh, some of the characteristics of of Joseph. And Pharaoh calls him. I mean, can you imagine? Now, this Hebrew young man, Pharaoh calls him. Verse 15. Said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And by the way... uh, You know, he had other people try to evaluate this dream, the sorcerers and the the mediums and all of that. I just want to say, keep away. The counterfeit is bad. Just don't don't get involved in the counterfeit. Nobody needs that. Uh, The Holy Spirit is a pure and holy spirit. And stay away from 
the other stuff that's out there, the, the false supernatural. The false supernatural could not help Pharaoh in this instance. And I want to tell you, even if the false supernatural seems to be helpful, stay away from it because it's all a lie. It, it's only the Holy Spirit who represents God. And Joseph had that. So he, he says, uh, Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have had a dream and no one can interpret it. I have heard about it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And listen to Joseph's answer. This is so beautiful. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. You know, it's so often dreams were the area Joseph was hurt. He had the two dreams about his brothers coming with their sheaf and bowing down before his sheaf. He had the dream about the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars coming and, and bowing down before him, his mother, father, his brothers. And once he shared that dream, everything went the wrong way. Dreams are the area that Joseph was wounded in. And I want to tell you, it's usually the places that you've been wounded in in your life are the areas that once God's got you healed up, he's going to release you to make a difference in other people's lives in those areas. And I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good news because I've been through some pretty hard stuff. And I know you've been through some pretty hard stuff too. But it's in these dreams. And so Joseph has come to the point where Pharaoh says to him, I've heard it said of you that you can interpret a dream. And he's probably thinking back at this point, oh brother, it's not in me. I thought I knew what those dreams meant when I was 17 years old. And that couldn't possibly have been what I thought they meant because I'd have never ended up here in this place. So he said, it's not in me. But he's developed through those times a, a confidence in God, a relationship with God, and an ability to hear from the Holy Spirit and commune from the Holy Spirit that he has a confidence that God has put him in that place at that time and that he will be God's representative to Pharaoh in that time. That is pretty amazing. That is very courageous. And so here in verse 16, he says, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. What had happened in the life of Joseph over the years? What had happened is a brokenness came into Joseph's life. A brokenness. It's not something any of us look forward to. It's not something any of us enjoy. A brokenness is when God exposes our fleshly attempts to live life, have our core needs of love, acceptance, worth, and security met in our own strength, and he exposes to us that we're doing it in our strength, and something changes inside of us where we become dependent upon him in a deeper level than we have known before. God, brokenness is God's gift to us. He exposes our self-reliance. He exposes our independence. He exposes our sinfulness. Brokenness is where we stop trusting in ourselves and we put our confidence in him and we move forward in life confident in God, in God's power in our life, in God's ability in our life. And we're not thinking that we are the answer. We know that he is the answer. That's brokenness. Brokenness had come into Joseph's life. I remember when I was at Bible college, they had a visiting preacher who had a book display. And I was looking at this book display. And I remember I was thinking, you know, I want to be one of those burning flames that change the world. I, I, I want to be a world changer. 
And so I went back to this book table to find a book that would help me become a world changer. And I picked up a book and I started to read it. I bought it, I started to read it. It was about the conquering God. And I thought, this is what I want, you know, the conquering God in my life. We're going to subdue nations. We're going to do these powerful things. And I started to read this book, and I was, I was so shocked because the whole th- pretext of the book was God wants to conquer you. <laughs> I wanted to conquer New York. God wanted to conquer me. <laughs> I remember one time at Bible college, they had an open mic, you know, time waiting on the Lord, and students could go up, and I had this message just burning in my heart about humility. And I went up and I shared in front of the student body and the faculty these thoughts on humility that were really real to me and burning in my heart. And People appreciated and liked it, and the, the faculty were smiling, you know, and I could, I could tell. And I remember walking away from sharing that thought about humility, so proud. <laughs> See, there's a lot of brokenness that has to come into our life. And God allows circumstances to come into our life that teach us dependence upon him, it, that not only teach us ex- dependence, but expose our lack of dependence upon him, expose our sinfulness, our pride, takes us to the cross that we can be forgiven and cleansed, and then we can move forward, not in our own strength, but we move forward in the Lord's strength. So Joseph, Pharaoh says to thee, it's, it's not in me, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Now, see, he wasn't broken to the point where he thought God can't use him. He knew God was going to use him. Brokenness doesn't mean I quit, I step out. Brokenness means I'm here, uh, I'm depending on the Lord, I'm not looking to my brain for the answer primarily, but I have an open heart to heaven and God, if you want to drop something in my heart, I'm willing to say it. See, that's where brokenness took Joseph. So let's take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 28. And that's why I tell people, you know, throughout my life, different times, people have told me, you can't pastor, you don't have what it takes. I told them, I already knew that, you know. I learned that a long time ago. I learned that my first experience of Christian leadership. I took a thriving group of 35 InterVarsity Christian Fellowship students, and I grew that down to 10. <laughs> so I already know that. But I have confidence, not in my ability, but in his ability. So I can stand boldly, even though Even though I know I can't do it, I can stand boldly and do it because my confidence is not in me, it's in him. It's in his calling upon my life. So I don't get worked up. You know, sometimes people try to bring the goat out in you, you know? This guy called me, that really happened. You don't have what it takes. Go be a businessman somewhere. And you're too short. <laughs> I didn't buy into it, you know. I, said, I already know that. I'll pray about it. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to fight. <laughs> Why well, fight about something you already know? I know I can't do it, you know. <laughs> So Genesis chapter 41, let's go back to there, verse 28. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten about in the land of Egypt, and famine will ravage the land so that the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be severe 
Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will bring it about quickly. So here we have, let's see if we can find this. Seven fat cows eaten by seven, I don't know what. <laughs> but you get the idea. Those kind of cows. <laughs> and when those kind of cows ate the fat cows, they weren't any plumper. That was his dream. So, now Joseph has the boldness to become an educator to Pharaoh. And in verse 33, as Pharaoh's taking this in, there's seven years coming of great abundance, followed by seven years of famine. And he's going to take Joseph's word for this. And the reason he's going to take Joseph's word for this is because he recognizes that Joseph is a man in whom is the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, people in the world are just dying to see Christians who they can tell are filled with the Holy Spirit. That there's something really from God genuinely in their life. People are hungry for that. They're wanting that. They, they want the confidence. And Pharaoh is actually going to believe Joseph, someone who's just come to him out of a prison from another country, someone he's never met in his life. But there's something about this man that he knows he's got the real thing going in his life. And he's going to trust his word when he has no proof of any of it. They didn't have the farmer's almanac. They couldn't go, what's the next seven years going to be? And they couldn't get on the internet and say, can you project the weather for the next seven years and the next 14 years? They, they had nothing like that at all. All he had was he was perplexed, he was confused, no one was able to help him, all his witchers and sorcerers couldn't do a thing, and suddenly before him there's this guy who's just come to him out of a prison who, who has a sense of God about his life. And this guy is telling him the interpretation of these dreams and they make sense to him. And now he's going to educate Pharaoh. Genesis 41, verse 33. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over all the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine that will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land Man will not perish during the famine. Wonderful plan. It's a word of wisdom from the Lord. He's given it to the most powerful man in his generation. Verse 41. He never saw this coming. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee, and he set him over all the land of Egypt. Verse 38, prior to that, Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there's no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over all my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Even only in the throne will I be greater than you. 
And here's the turnaround that comes in Joseph's life. He would have never expected this, could have never seen this coming. But Pharaoh promotes him. Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? You know, what if where we worked, people said that about us? With all the pressures that come with work, here's a man in whom is a divine spirit or the Holy Spirit. God wants us to shine. And he's filled us to be able to shine. And Joseph has just been set over all the land of Egypt. He's got his signet ring. The Pharaoh's, that's a credit card. He could stamp that into wax anywhere in the nation and get anything he wanted. He, you know, he, he's, he's been taken from the prison to the palace because of his relationship with God. And I have a feeling, this isn't in the Bible, so I can't say it for sure, but I have a feeling Mrs. Potiphar is asking her husband if she can go to Turkey <laughs> quickly <laughs> and maybe Potiphar is thinking maybe he'll join. <laughs> that he wasn't that kind of man. Can we find a man like this? Moreover, verse 44, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. I'm hopelessly behind in this thing, but... Uh, Joseph was 30 years of age when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 13 years have passed. He's 17 when this whole thing started. You ever feel like God's forgotten about you for a long time? Sometimes we feel that way, but the truth is he hasn't. And the truth is that even when we're in the worst of it, when we're in a prison that it seems like we're never going to get out of, there's things that are happening that God is orchestrating that we are not aware of. And in the right time, he brings it to pass. And he uses those prison experiences to introduce us to the people who are going to be significant in bringing God's purpose out of our life. And I'd like to ask if our ushers could distribute the elements of communion. And we're going to take communion together here today. But I want you to think about this. You may feel like some of your best years were lost because of what others brought into your life. It doesn't stop God from bringing his plan. And in those years, just like in the years in my life that those things have happened, we learn brokenness. It's a gift. Our self-sufficiency is exposed and we repent of it. And we learn dependence. And we develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Charlene had a dream Actually, it was a vision when she was about 17. And in this vision, she saw this stormy sea, dangerous sea, dark, dangerous, foreboding. And she set out on a boat down a coastline and left a series of lights with other people. And as she looked back up the coastline, there were, she could see three prominent lights that had been left in this journey. Well, we realized about a year ago that this is our third church plant. And God had shown her all those years ago that we would plant three churches. We planted one in England, one in Scotland, and, and one here. 
But in our second church plant, we had a very serious illness that hit our family that was life-changing, and we literally lost everything except human life. Everything you can lose with the exception of human life, we lost. We lost our home, we lost our country, we lost our car, we lost our possessions, we lost, we lost everything. And we came back here, and after about a year and a half, I was invited to be on the staff of a very safe church <laughs> called Faith Community. <laughs> And about seven months after being on the staff at that very safe church, the whole thing began to die a horrible death. And in the midst of that, it was real to us that we had to stay and start our third church. We didn't want to. We wanted to go. You know, people walked up to me in Giant Eagle I'd never met. You're going to start a church. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not making this up. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. Our world went up in one atomic cloud. And I felt God say, watch me. We've been watching them ever since. Learned brokenness in a deeper level. Self-dependence exposed, repented of. Dependence upon the Lord embraced. You know, that's part of the process. If you want to be a world changer, you know, he's going to change you. He's going to take you to the cross. But you're not going to die on the cross. You're going to rise again, you know, with the Lord. You, there's... There's a deeper purpose that's going to be fulfilled. And, and in the worst times of life, you've got to know that he's doing things you're not aware of. And the time will come when he brings it to the forefront. And Joseph, do you think Joseph would trade the 13 years of horror, agony, panic for the things that God did through him in his life? I don't think, I think if he could do it all again, he wouldn't change it. Because God used him in a singular way. And without Joseph, it's plain that his family would have died because he's, it says that in the scripture a little later on. God sent him to preserve the life of his family. If his whole family had died, guess what? There's no Messiah. It ends there. And do you know that's the biggest thing that God wants to do through us is to bring Christ into other people's lives. And so he allows us to get this brokenness through adversity and circumstances where we find repentance and and understand the power of the cross. And even though we wouldn't choose to go the path that we have to go sometimes in the natural, he, cho he, he chooses to use that path to change us and to change other people through us. And that's called childlike faith. That's called delighting in the Lord. And even if you're still in that prison and you don't know how you're ever going to get out, he knows. And do what Joseph did. Joseph developed such a relationship with God in the hard times that he could stand with confidence before Pharaoh. When Pharaoh brings up to him the thing that wounded him, dreams. And he say, it's not in me. He meant it. He knew he couldn't interpret dreams because he tried. And that's how he ended up in prison. But he knew that God could. And it's in the areas that you've been wounded 
that you're going to find an anointing coming out of your life to help other people in. Not only the areas you've been wounded in, but there is something very powerful about the areas that you've been wounded in. God's going to send an anointing out of your life to make Jesus real to other people through those things. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church. I want to thank you for watching this video of our worship service. God is on the move, and we are so thankful. I'd love to invite you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here at Zion Christian Church. I know that you would be encouraged by our worship and the ministry of God's Word. It's a wonderful group of people to be connected to. Why not join us this Sunday at Zion Christian Church? God bless you. Oh,